Okay, sorry for the long, longer and longer break. Uh, okay, so now what we're going to do is <coughs> so we went through the, the principally, principally how you set up content negotiation. Hetios, we're still going to do next and pagination. Code version, uh, so implementation. So, okay, uh, first thing, Hetios first. So I'm going to take the user example that I constructed here as my uh, my basis for creating the, the Hetios uh, response. So let me look at my first version of users. So here in the users resource, I have a get one. Okay, so this method here is meant to return one user based on the ID that's supplied. So I say you give it the right ID, you return the one user object. Now oh, in the middle of the method is still not implemented yet, right? Yeah. Okay. So in order to get one user object, um, I'll probably want to support it by a, a get user model. So under the models uh, package, I'm going to create a new class. Get user model. So the get user model basically will return uh, what I need to display on the app. So when you're when you're writing the methods here and there, um, it's very easy to just create a whole the whole schema and just return it back. You know? but you really sometimes you need to look at what you need in the application. So there are two ways of doing this. One is Jasu, you just return everything in the schema. Okay, whatever you have in the database for users, if there's four columns, ten columns, return all of them. Okay. And then you let the application decide what to do with it. It's not too bad. I don't think it makes a very big difference in terms of the performance. So look at users. In my user table, I have a total of five columns, ID, name, email, full password. So at this point, when I'm retrieving data, I need to decide which one do I want to return. Should I return everything here, including password? Now, password is interesting because if you notice nowadays, a lot of password systems, when you view account, changing password is a separate UI by itself. In fact, very often or not, when those systems, when they do an API, they don't necessarily return the password in the user information. In fact, they will never return the password. When they do a change password, they will ask you to send in your original password and the new password, and then compare and then update it. Why are they doing that? Okay, so if you're going to transmit information like password over the internet in a response to your Android application, because it's going to travel over the internet, chances of exposing this to people who are listening in the middle is very high. So maybe you don't want to return the password here. Or could be the other information. So although you can secure the trans communication using SSL, um, things like password may not be transmitted. So maybe in this case, I'll just return name, email, and phone. Right? And of course, with the, I think ID is not needed because since I already sent the ID. So I'll focus on what will be displayed. Name, email, and that's one. Why am I typing on the wrong thing? Right. What else do I have? I have transaction and contact. So the information return belong to profile. Okay. And then under there I have next I have transaction and contact. So I need to group them under profile. How do I do that? So this is case in this case it's like putting a class in a class. Maybe I should change a little bit of stuff here. So maybe I do a get user profile model. So maybe I'll transfer this. So I'm gonna move all these three things over to the get user profile model. Okay, reason being is inside the get user model. Okay, so these things all belong now to the profile model instead. Because I have profile transaction and contacts, right? So under the get user model, I'm gonna create uh 
property called get user profile. They call it profile. Now, this one will be yeah, do that. Okay. So this will form my profile. Now if I don't want it to return in capital P, maybe I can I can add in the JSON property to say on a small P instead. Right? So that's my profile. Next transaction and context. So transaction itself is a list, array list. You can use array list in Java. Contact is also an array list. So to do this. Okay. So array list in Java you can specify the type. You can bind the type to the array list. Here maybe I will use the get transaction model type. You must import this one, you too. So, I'm the piggy bank on I'm doing piggy bank on the get transaction model that I created earlier on, right? And bind it to the type of array list. Okay, the next property to create will be the context. Um, so, now I don't have context under the model so I need to create maybe a contact model here just to you know, demonstrate that do I need to keep this on the screen a bit more longer? who's typing? no or wait for me out of the code cannot, you can wait for me out of the code so. okay uh, sorry, this one will be context. Okay. Um, context here, I imagine in my application to be the people who this user is going to transfer money to or receive money from. So maybe the context will look a little bit similar to the user profile. Okay, maybe this is similar to how the contact looks like. Let me correct this thing to P. Full here should be capitalized. Okay, so let me create one more class. For this so get contact model uh, probably have a yes or name so I imagine you want to address your friend by the full name that register the system you just can give them an alias uh, they also have a user ID right okay so for contact probably I will leave it as this too Okay, Let's simplify this a bit. So here would be another array list it's based on my so based on this schema here, right? Context is array list again. Okay. Okay. Contact model. So list of contacts. Okay. When you have created an object um, class, when you define a class that has uh, references to objects, especially lists, right? It's probably prudent to have a default constructor to initialize the list. So the reason why we initialize the list is less you need to have somewhere that does a for loop array, you don't get an error that says this is a. Uh, not defined. Okay. Same goes for the object or the user profile. Okay. okay. Um, so this sort of forms the object that will return. So next thing is to Okay, so next step is to actually write the method retrieve from the database. So where we will write the method will be under the user manager under services. So here are the same methods. I will add one more in. So here will be to return. Oops, what happened? So here we get 
user model. by ID right. so normally when you write a function okay so we write a method or function um, when you need to think about what's your return type and also when you like populate the data in the return type. Uh, so just now I was talking about talking about, talking about functions and all that. When we write functions and we have a return type, especially when this is not a void, um, try to keep your return statement at the end. It's a like head and tails. Try not to have the return statement in the middle of the body. Okay. So it's clearer for you to debug and see what's going on. So I usually would start off by writing the method and then uh, initialize the object on the return and at the end of the method, just before I close the method, I do a return of the object. So it's very clear there's only one place I return it and not multiple places. In the middle will be my body where I will decide, okay, here's my SQL statement or here's the logic I need to do. So when I'm doing a get user, of course I will only I will definitely be re referring to the user table here and transaction table and also, also I got context but so we'll skip the context table we'll just focus on users and transaction first so this single method here will attempt to retrieve data from the users and the transactions okay so the kind thing of it like a two-step process uh, you can also combine it as like a one-step process uh, using joins but we'll not do that for this class so I'll split on two two steps. One is to get user from user table. Okay. The next is to get the transactions of user from transaction table. Normally I try to write some comments so that I keep track of what I'm gonna do. So it's like step one, this step two is that. Uh, the try statement here is specifically there because I'm going to do SQL calls using the prepared statement and connection. So this is to capture if any like connection issues would arise or the syntax error and such. So the first one is to get a cost connection. This is like Typically, when you're gonna write a lot of these methods to to retrieve data from the database, you're gonna be doing this all most all the time. Okay, then you're gonna do a prepare statement. So at this point, you want to think about how am I gonna retrieve from the database to based on the user ID. Okay. So if I were to write the SQL statement, okay. Just select star from users where id is equals to question mark. So the question mark here, if for revision sake, is meant to for you to actually substitute it later with a set method. Say that oh, the first question mark at this index beginning from one uh, is going to be assigned this value. And SQL, the prepare statement will actually merge it and send it as a single statement to the server. So here I have a set statement, and the type of value and setting is an integer. So you select, you use the set int. The value you're going to pull in will be ID, which is coming from the parameter of the method get user here. So if let's say I'm looking for a user ID nine from the database table, then you will select start from users where ID is equal nine. You can probably optimize it a little bit more instead of using the asterisk symbol, which is to specify the exact columns you want to return. Uh, reason for this is you want to try to reduce the amount of traffic between database to your application, especially when in the architecture or some systems uh, where they put a database on a different server and your application server on another server, and both of them are running on the network. So I think in some places, like, uh, some organizations are very particular about the data you retrieve from the database. Like they, only, they have a rule that says, only take what you need 
nothing more and nothing less. So, but it's easy to always turn the S3 there to say get everything. So for the DBMA perspective, it's always you should take what you need and you shouldn't clog up the network with too much data moving in between. So if I'm really going to be very particular about this one, based on my user model, I'm only retrieving uh, when you get user profile model, I'm only retrieving three information. So I should only just retrieve the three and nothing more and nothing less. The three information I'm going to retrieve will be the name, email, and phone. Okay. So based on the table, right, I'll replace this in name, email, and phone. So exact, exact to what I need require. So this is the first step. Um, of course, after I've done the set methods, I should turn myself the rest of the result set. So this is the RS, I'll say RS user, result set for the user. It's a good query. So if you recall, in order for a result set to be valid, you need to do a next method. By calling next method, you points uh, it's called a pointer. So imagine an invisible pointer pointing at the first record. Now the first record doesn't exist. Okay, failed somehow. Okay, so if it fails, then you need to handle it. Like at this point, if it fails, you probably shouldn't do the second step, which is to get the transactions. So we'll think about that a little bit later. Um, so if it's possible, like you've got next is successful, you need to put the put the values and put it into the user profile. So here the user profile because it's instantiated, I'll start to assign the values it over. So here I'll say name is get string, okay, and of course it's always easy to use the actual database column name rather than the index. is transactions. So later I'm going to come back to what if it fails, right? So assuming everything's uh, nicely retrieved, nothing broke, okay, I'm going to create a next statement. So here you could actually like reuse or uh, reassign the statement, since you already have the data, you can re reuse the statement and create and set a new SQL statement inside that. So I'm here I'm going to retrieve transactions that are created uh, or related to this user. Actually, we should correctly say related. So related to this user would be based on either whether the recipient ID or send ID is matching the user ID. So if the user is sending money, of course his ID will be the recipient ID portion. Uh, uh, sending ID, send, if the user is sending the money, he will be under send ID. If the user, the user is receiving money, then his ID will be under the recipient ID. So you need to re do a query in the transaction where recipient ID and send ID matches this user's ID. Right? So I'll do a select star from. So here I'm just going to write the actual statement out. Right? Now, if suddenly you see this uh, blue coloring of the text, okay, it means it's a Reserve keyword in MySQL. Um, I mean, sometimes it, it may not work properly. To get around this, you can actually put it in a single the standard quote. Okay, so here I'm going to simulate the thing. So I'm going to say, okay, give me transactions where the current user could be the sender, number nine, or uh, is a recipient or recipient or sender. So this is what the SQL query is going to look like. So any any um, transactions that has this users as a sender or recipient will come out. Well, to test a query, I can do this. Of course, right now I have nothing in the transaction table, so just run with this first. So I'm going to put that statement into the table into the parameter here.
Okay. So they're going to replace the 9 with the question mark. So this is going to be for me to set the parameters. So first question mark is for recipient ID. Wait from the ID here. And second question mark is for also the send ID. We're taking from user ID here. Okay. So when I'm getting user, I'm going to use, reuse the ID parameter to extract all the transition where he's a sender or a recipient. So far, good. Okay. So now I get the result set for transactions. So same rule. If next is valid, that means there's, there's, there's data. Okay. Okay, now, okay, so here, here, instead of using an if, actually I should be using a while because I have multiple transactions. Right. So, use this. So while there is a date that is data in the result set, I should always, you know, go in. So now I will go user transactions at new okay, transaction. Although, okay, um, ideally, what I'm thinking of doing is when I instance the get transaction model and pass the data in via from the result set, right? If I don't, it doesn't matter. It's not what I've done so far. You say create, create a variable here, dx, okay? Instance this guy, and then Set the amount to yeah, then populate the details. Okay, it's gonna get very long. <clears throat> okay. So for each of the columns I'm returning, so CPU ID is okay. CPU ID is integer. Okay, let me think. Actually, I don't need receiver ID. Okay, time will be more important. Uh, transaction date time. Okay, so transaction model, I am missing one more item.
You are still typing? Copy. <coughs> Okay, so coming back to if you if somewhere around here failed somehow. Now, if you unable to get a user because ID is invalid, <coughs> doesn't exist, you shouldn't try to get the transactions. Right? So how do we handle this? <coughs> so normally what I will do is I will create a boolean variable like let's get user success. Okay. <coughs> Normally, I'll create a variable, variable somewhere ahead. So this will be for me to determine whether I should do the next step, which is a get transaction. So initialize to true. So assume that assume that it's successful. So when it fails, I'll set as false. And then at the later part, which is the next step, if I need to do this. I will just check if it's successful, then I will do this block. Okay, so that's handles that's handled. Uh, okay, there's some part here that I'm a bit worried about, which is the get you get date. So Java has this has the date type which exists in Java SQL and Java Util. Okay, so both are slightly different, uh, different in a way. So when I get a date, um, I think there's always been the issue where the not the full data gets over uh, gets transferred over. Yeah, well, we we'll use this first. So one of the ways to get around this is to do some conversion to some format and then put it to the normal date time Java YouTube. Okay, so but anyway, now it seems fine. Okay, so once I'm done with this, um, I get user. I need to go back to my sources user. So this is a get user object, right? So get user model. Okay, use a pass ID in, and for the response, of course, I would turn get user model. Oh, sorry, user. Okay, so if I, because I'm returning a object, uh, I will need to declare what's the so called the producers, what's the format of the data. Otherwise, there's no kind of format to return. So here you can actually use like, for example, your content negotiation to decide if you want to use uh, either one or just stick to one format here. Um, be careful when you right click to, I mean, you click on this to import. Uh, the first option gives you some is some is from some other package. So make sure you're choosing the correct one, which is Java X WSRS. Okay, to import. Okay, so if all this is fine, um, once this part is done, you can actually test it out. Uh, if you're Glassfish, you need to publish it. Uh, if you're using a Tomcat, you can just restart the server. So, I'm going to do a get user. Okay, right now I haven't put any uh, roles allowed here, user. So, Right now, this is accessible by public. Anyone can call this method. So we're gonna go to Postman, um, create add a new tab, change this to users, and then uh, put in a user ID that exists. So no, number seven exists. So I'm gonna take number seven ID here. Which is a get request and send. Okay, so the complaint users not found because it's a capital U, I think. Yeah, capital U, that's why. Okay, so seems to be status 200 okay, except that my data looks funny. 
Right, so I should have something from name, email, phone, but I got now instead. Okay. Probably happened because there's an error that happened somewhere. Oh, okay. I forgot to space out. Yeah. Okay, when you're doing the SQL statement in, in Eclipse, because it gets very long, and you break the line. If you break the line because it's already a um, double quota, right? You will not add a space for you. So if especially when the users and the where needs to have a space to manually put a space in there. I think that's why I got the SQL error. It didn't populate the data. Yeah, so see, I got my user ID 7 in the database, which is John. I changed this to 8. This person is Ace plus 9. I think I have a 9. Yeah. Okay, so this works. Uh, transaction, of course, nothing there because I, I have no transactions in the table yet. Okay. So this structure right now works in the sense that my basic get user. Nothing fancy, no HDOs inside yet. Okay. Then later we'll do if have machining together with HDOs. Right? Okay, so tap. So now I'm gonna add in the concept of uh, which should I do first? HTOS because of API versioning. Okay, API versioning and HTOS. So right now I have a V2 users, okay? And it also has a get one method, which actually uh, I want to attempt to overwrite this method here. So let me just make sure that I have the same producers also. I don't intend to change that. Okay, so it's gonna do this. It's gonna do similar thing. Okay, but for the get manage for the manager method here. So this current existing manager method get user returns me uh, fairly bloated data, potentially bloated data. So I wanna have a different method. So I will go to the user manager and create another get method that is more streamlined. So right now what I want to is to return a get user profile. I only want a profile. I'm going to populate. My plan is to give me the profile, which is the important information. I will populate the rest of the stuff here in the web service itself. Either web service or in the method, the links here. Since the links here uh, don't have any business logic to, to restrict the links, I'm going to just put them in the, in the uh, web service. So I'm going to say get user profile. So same thing again, user profile model. instance of this, return that profile. And in the middle, it will be my deck cut rolling. Oh. Okay. So in the middle, we try and catch again. So here is actually this is exactly like here, right? Copy this over. And same thing as this. Okay. So except for this part, right? So here okay, I think it's similar. Yeah, as you can see, I'm very lazy. Yeah. Just reuse. Yeah. Okay. 
So this is one down. So now I'm going to go back to the V2 method and use this here. Create a user private, a user manager private method, private uh, variable. Okay, so, okay, user profile. So I'm going to do this first. But that's not the end of the story yet. Eventually, what this method return is the ATL slide structure, which is like that. Okay. So here contains a profile attribute followed by a link property. The link has this of links. So I'm gonna create a link class, uh, link model class, which will represent this. Then later on, a uh, so-called updated user profile class, user get user model class that will look like this. Here I'm going to call out the link. Link will have label URL method. Okay. So simple <coughs> link prop object here will satisfy. Right? Next one for my okay. Let me just standardize this. Uh, since I'm using multi uppercase. Okay. This is to create a So actually I'm gonna V2 my models also. So the B2 get user model here. I have this. So one part for the array, one part for the profile, and the other is for the links. My link is from oh, okay. and my constructor So my updated user profile is ready. So I'll go back to so what, this is like the V2 version of the user pro, user model that uh, the V1 has. So okay, now I can go back to the V2 for users. Okay, uh, this one, right? So here I will user model. So assign the profile to the one I received earlier and the links ah, okay so links here I need to decide, right? To add a new link model. So I'll create a new link model for link transactions. Okay, 
Okay, the way I probably imagine this to be more scalable in this project, if it gets bigger, is uh, a separate class that will actually generate these links based on certain conditions. So you can see I'm actually filling up like okay, since it is a user and you need to get to the uh, transactions, how is it going to you are going to like? Okay. So it's kind of like one by one you create all these things. Okay, if I'm a bit tired, I can just copy it. Okay, so now my user model is ready, I can return it as a response. So, here I have uh, version 2 of my users, get one user, along with uh, it deals the links to transaction and contacts. So, let's say you have your version 2 of an Android application and you call it a version 2 API, you can pull this data out and then you can just refer to the link provided for transaction and the link provided context. And because it, here, okay, so here is very simple. Maybe somewhere in the future you will decide that, oh, based on certain conditions, context will not be displayed. Um, then your UI will can, can also change according to what is available in the data. Okay, so let me start this. So now I have this this original get users. Save this one. Okay. So okay. duplicate this tab. Okay. So in front of users, I'm gonna call the v2 method. So this is the v2 method result. So you can see that it returns me just a profile information. As for links, you give me links to transaction and contacts. So in your Android application, you can have like the first version that calls this method based on this URL. It works because it's expecting data to format to be like this. When your improved version will actually just use the V2 path, a V2 of the resource, and you handle data accordingly. So let me just. Uh, I'm just to just a V2. Clear so far. This example will be uploaded to GitHub. Yeah, and you'll get a link. Okay, do you want me to proceed with pagination or you want to call it a, day, a night? Already? Stop. Continue. Hmm? The URL is here. It's just a directory for now. For now, it's a directory. Uh, I think the, the intention is that if you, let's say, have any business logic uh, that controls the visibility of URL, you can do it from the server side. So, example, maybe, um, so example, let's say your users in the app uh, pick their free users. Okay. So, free users in your money transfer app can only see transactions, cannot see contacts. Don't have the contacts feature. So maybe they for them when they get the data in the view in the view profile in the Android app, they only see one transaction statement. Now the paid user with some kind of subscription or premium uh, membership will get the second link here. 
So that's one of the examples you can like detect or control from server side what appears. And conveniently, if your Android actually takes this as a cue to display the labels or buttons, right? You know, it kind of changes your interface very easily. So you don't need to actually embed the logic in your Android app to decide, oh, current user is this type, not display this, display that. So maybe in that sense, it simplifies a bit. Because I know when you're doing the UI application, UI implementation and back end, sometimes we have this cross logic like, the UI needs to have some kind of logic to determine that, oh, since this person or this data is like that, then I display the interface differently, right? So this, this, this is the thing with a lot of uh, interface development, that you have a lot of business logic also like integrated into the interface programming. But I think we're trying to try to wean off as much as possible so that your logic is, is actually determined from the server side itself. It's also cost effective in the way that, let's say you need to make changes to the business logic. It doesn't need to impact the interface development that much. Okay. So maybe we'll call this a night and I will continue the last part, which is pagination for transaction in the next lesson. And then you all will be almost done with CA 280. Almost there, almost there, just a few features. Oh, yeah. The V1 is the more Gyasu thing, right? You just throw all the data out. Yeah, and then you. Yeah, but then it's a lot of wastage, uh, like, there's a lot of unnecessary information based on the interface. Okay, anyone have a consult need to consult me on your assignment or anything you can you can start now? Ask questions. <laughs> How's I don't remember that? <laughs> oh, hold <on. clears> on. <throat> More information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Change your programming assignment 20. So, cut out the data. Cut out the data. Cut out the data. I already extend the cut out. Uh, what did I put? Uh? Technically, I extended. Uh. Actually, I don't really like go and nitpick on the, the actual data submit, right? I'll say. See. Uh, I can extend until okay. I can extend until when end of this month. But then we going very close to C A two. Yeah, but then you give me more than one shot in the end. <laughs> <laughs> I will say next Sunday la. I mean 14th that week next Sunday huh? 19th 19th uh. mm? mm. yeah Sorry? Demo. demo. If you submitted and it's working fine, you don't need demo. Yeah. I just read through the code, fine. Nineteena, Marcus, right? Nineteena. Nineteena, Nineteena. Any longer, I'll give, ask you for CA1, CA2 together. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I'll be putting it on. Is because we have quite a bit of time, do you have any time? Yeah, I'll post tonight. <laughs>
But you follow if you follow along what we're doing right, you won't be very far from it. Lah. That's why I can show you. Can you go to the Facebook first? To this one, huh? Can. Okay. 